I'm really happy to be here tonight, honored even to introduce Isabella Hamad on this sort of heavy and rather historic day in the international news cycle. The last time I did an introduction at the Y, it was for an evening of writers from the Bronx that were featuring instead two writers from further afield, each by way of England, is a testament not only to the excellent programming of Bernard Schwartz and the team at the Poetry Center, but is also a testament to the enduring importance of New York City and its meaning for international writing, especially now, especially tonight. It's essential to remember and celebrate this city as a haven for artists and writers from all over the world. And thus, thank you for coming and for supporting the mission of this institution and also for supporting the literary arts in our fair and complicated city. Isabella Hamad's first novel, The Parisian, is in part about time about conceptions of time, about the reckoning with time. And so I will briefly give this introduction in reverse chronology. First, what a delight it has been as a person who cares about the contemporary novel to watch this year the Parisian get the attention it so richly deserves this deeply serious, intellectual, philosophical, and multi-generational account of a family from Palestine and its reckoning with Europe and European culture in the period of greatest crisis for Palestine as nation and people. Hamad's book performs a feat of representation, it's true, it makes an indelible cast of characters out of a family of Palestinian Arabs from 1914 to 1934, including the titular character Midhat, an aspiring doctor who goes to France during the First World War in part to stay well clear of military service, but who in the process sees the European disorder and ferment of that time against the backdrop of an awakening of political identity in Palestine. The novel performs this feat of representation as though it were not in any way politically unlikely in the present instance. Both performs and justly routinizes but it also at the same time makes a statement about novel writing itself. Hamad's idea of the novel is an incredibly ambitious one. On the one hand, featuring the kind of psychological acuity of an E.M. Forster, and on the other, the scale and grandiosity of Russian novels, of Tolstoy even. She finds the European novel at the summit of its achievement and indicates that as a writer of Palestinian origin, she has complete command of it. That its rhetorical power can, in fact, be appropriated. Or perhaps she indicates that the European novel is the co-equal possession of all readers everywhere. Hamad also manages emanations of feminism and contemporary cultural critique, even while demonstrating the full-scale veneer of a novel of politics and ideas. And this is rather astounding, really, that all of this should be present in a first novel and so fully formed. How thrilling that readers and critics have responded to this work and to its significant ambition with a properly scaled respect and admiration. I should say for this reader that what I additionally love about Hamad's novel is the tremendous warmth 
and melancholy of it, the way a perfectly turned sentence in the midst of the summary of epochal historical developments will nonetheless remind us of the ache of a lost mother or the way in which a wristwatch in 1914 would have functioned. And in this way, there is the promise in Hamad's work of even more psychological acuity and emotionally exacting prose writing to come where she already so significantly excels. And now I wanna go further back in time, backwardly, and confess that Isabella Hamad was once a student in my classroom when I taught at NYU, and she was getting her MFA there. And so this introduction must in brief note what a tremendous pleasure it is to introduce one student from the podium, one student who is now one's excellent colleague and friend. And I will tell you that there was never a moment when Isabella Hamad was anything but the writer so vitally on display in the Parisian. Indeed, we, her peers and teachers, read a chunk of the manuscript in those days, and I'm pretty sure that we once suggested that she change a semicolon. <laughs> and that was about the extent of the changes that were properly leveled at the text. It was underway and it was essentially complete in terms of conceptual apparatus and it was a wonder to behold this thing which we already knew would be published and would receive the attention it so richly deserves, etc. She was a leader in the classroom in the workshop, a leader among her peers as she is now among her generation of novelists. And my point here is this, what a rewarding thing, let me say, to see a talent so magnificent and to know it immediately and to see it come to fruition. It's the thing that one gets into the teaching business for. Finally, let me go back even a bit further and say that once I was teaching a class at NYU on experimental writing, that was the name of the class, a literature class, and it was the first day of an academic year, and I was teaching my first seminar of the semester, and I said as a point of departure that day, I'm gonna give you a sort of a pop quiz, and I want everyone in the class to jot down a few lines about what you think postmodernism means. And I gave the class a few minutes, and then I said, okay, Let's hear some of the lines you've composed. And I believe I picked the student nearest to me and I said, okay, how about you? And the student nearest me, a young woman, read out in astonishingly complete sentences and perfectly composed paragraphs, a remarkable and subtle evocation of what it means to experiment in prose writing and the history thereof since the war and these lines were electrifying. I was so astounded by this mono monological display by how much better she had done with the explication of postmodernism than I could have done myself. And I likewise noticed the thudding silence that followed this disquisition when everyone realized there was nothing more to be said. <laughs> And on we moved in a sort of stunned reverie to some other topic while I took note of the keenness of the writer in question. And that night I went home, was reading email, and there encountered a message from the great American writer Amy Hempel, who was in those days teaching at Harvard. And that note said, by the way, you're gonna encounter this student of mine from Harvard, really incredible young writer, Bella Hamad, and you should keep an eye out. There's something really special there. And thus did all the strands of time line up, time past and time present. 
and I saw ahead of me, even then, in those moments, the beginning of something great, this confident, knowing, wise writer you're about to hear, and you, too, should keep an eye out now and into the foreseeable. Please let us welcome the magnificent Isabella Hamad. Hi. Thank you so much, Rick. I feel very um, shocked and moved, um, and I'm also very honored to be here. I'm delighted to be sharing the stage with Salman. It's such an honor. Um, I'm going to read you three sections of the novel um, and explain a little bit in between, but the first one is just from the beginning, so I don't need to explain anything, hopefully. The year is 1914. Make sure my water... There was one other Arab on board the ship to Marseille. His name was Farouk al azmi and the day after leaving port in Alexandria, he approached Midhat at breakfast with a plate of toast in one hand and a string of amber prayer beads in the other. He sat, tugged at the cuffs of his shirt, and started to describe without any introduction how he was returning from Damascus to resume his teaching post in the language department of the Sorbonne. He had left Paris at the outbreak of war, but after the miracle of the Marne was determined to return. He had gray eyes and a slightly rectangular head. Beris, he sighed. It is where my life is. To young Midhat Kamal, this statement was highly suggestive. In his mind, a gallery of lamps directly illuminated a dance hall full of women. He looked closely at Farouk's clothes. He wore a pale blue three-piece suit and an indigo tie with a silver tie pin in the shape of a bird. A cane of some dark, unpainted wood leaned against the table. I am going to study medicine, said Midhat, at the University of Montpellier. Bravo, said Farouk. Midhat smiled as he reached for the coffee pot. Muscles he had not known were tense, began to relax. This is your first visit to France, said Farouk. Midhat said nothing, assenting. Five days had passed since he said goodbye to his grandmother in Nablus and traveled by mule to Tulkarim, where he joined the, li the, the Haifa line for Kantara East and changed trains for Cairo. After a few days at his father's house, he boarded the ship in Alexandria. He had become accustomed to the endless skin of the water, broken by white crests, flashing silver at noon. Lunch was at one, tea was at four, dinner was at 7.30, and at first he sat alone watching the Europeans eat with their knives. He developed a habit of searching a crowded room for the red hair of the captain, a Frenchman named Gorin, and after dinner would watch him enter and exit the bridge where he supervised the helm. Yesterday he started feeling lonely. It happened suddenly. Sitting beside the stern, waiting for the captain, he became conscious of his back against the bench, a sensation that was bizarrely painful. He was aware of his legs extending from his pelvis. His nose, usually invisible, doubled and intruded on his vision. The outline of his body weighed on him as a hard, sore shape, and his heart beat very fast. He assumed the feeling would pass, but it did not, and that evening simple interactions with the quartermaster, dining attendants, other passengers, took on a strained and breathless quality. It must be obvious to them, he thought, how raw his skin felt. During the night, he pressed the stem of his pocket watch compulsively in the dark, lifting the lid on its pale face. The ticking lulled him to sleep. Then he woke a second time, and continuing to check the hour as the night progressed, began to see in those twitching hands the spasms of something monstrous. It was with a strong feeling of relief, therefore, and a sense that his sharp outline had softened slightly, that he smiled back at his new friend. What do you imagine it will be like, said Farouk? Imagine what? France. Before I came the first time, I had many pictures of it in my mind. Some turned out to be quite accurate in the end. Some were... He pinched his lips and smiled. For some reason, I had an idea about wigs. You know, the false hair. I'm not sure where I got it from. Possibly I had seen an old drawing. 
Midhat made a sound like he was thinking and looked through the window at the sea. His high school in Constantinople was modelled on the French lycée. The textbooks were all French imports, as were half the teachers and even most of the furniture. Midhat and his classmates had sat on ladder-back chairs with woven rush seats reading La Poésie Epique en Grèce, memorising the names of elements in a mixture of French and Latin, and only when the bell rang did they slip into Turkish and Arabic and Armenian in the corridor. Once formulated in French, certain concepts belonged in French, so that, for instance, Midhat knew the names of his internal organs as le poumon and le cœur and le cerveau and l'encéphale, and understood philosophical abstractions by their French names, l'altruisme, la condition humaine. And yet, despite being steeped for five years in all things French, he struggled to conjure a picture of France that was separate from the furnishings of his classrooms, whose windows had displayed a hot Turkish sky and admitted shouts of Arabic from the water. Even now, from the vantage of this ship, Provence remained hidden by fog and the earth's unsealable curves. He looked back at Farouk. I cannot imagine it. He waited for Farouk's scorn, but Farouk only shrugged and dropped his eyes to the table. Were you ever in Montpellier, said Midhat. No, only Paris. Of course, the university is famous for medicine. Didn't Rabelais study there? Ah, you know about Rabelais. Farouk returned to his cabin after breakfast, and Midhat climbed the staircase to the deck and sat beside the stern. He stared at the sea and listened with partial comprehension to a group of European officials, Dutch, French, English, shouting from the next bench, first about the technology of the vessel and then about the German advance on Paris. Boards quaked beneath Midhat's feet. A child was scampering along the deck. Beyond, a pair of young women compared carte postale and the wind harassed the tassels on their parasols. Those were the same girls who last night at dinner had displayed their lovely hair like hats, crimped and waved and decorated with jewels that sparkled under the chandeliers. At last, the door to the bridge opened and a red-haired man, Captain Gorin, stepped out and cracked his knuckles. A uniformed official leapt from the bench to address him and as Gorin's lips moved, soundless to mid-hat in the wind, the grooves in his face deepened. He cupped his hands over a cigarette, shook a match free of its flame and held the lit end in his palm against the wind. The other man departed and Gorin smoked over the rail for a while. His curls flung about, they seemed barely attached to his head. He flicked the butt overboard and retreated below deck. So, um, the first part of the book, Midhat um, spends in Montpellier studying medicine um, and he's staying in the house of an academic and he falls in love with the academic's daughter. Um, and at the end of the first part, he moves to Paris for various reasons that I won't spoil. Um, and then he returns to Palestine at the end of the war. Um, and what's happened in the meantime is that the um, Arabs of the Hejaz have made a deal with the Brits. This is the story of the Lawrence of Arabia, which you probably, many of you will know, um, to attack the, um, the Ottoman railway um, in order to defeat the Ottoman army. And they do this in exchange for British help uh, in establishing an Arab state in the Middle East. The British made lots of promises at that time, and predictably they did not um, make good on this promise. <coughs> But the prince from the Hejaz, who was a guy called Emir Faisal, ends up in Damascus and they decide in 1920 to declare a Syrian kingdom. And Syria at that time included Palestine, Lebanon, and um, what is today Jordan, kind of greater Syria. And Midhat is in, is in Nablus in Palestine, um, under British rule now. The British and the French have carved up the Middle East. And they, they hear this news and they decide they're going to march to Jerusalem to show their support of Emir Faisal, or King Faisal's new Syrian kingdom, of which they are a part. Um, and he goes with his cousin, Jamil, um, on the train. And I should say also that his father has said that he should marry um, a local girl. And the person that they have in mind is someone called Fath Muhammad. And he's seen her, and she think, he thinks she's very attractive. And that's as much as I, um, if you can remember all of that. But. OK. Over the next three hours, Midhat fell into a daydream. He thought of what Hani had said in his letter about naming themselves Syrians and wondered what might happen next. Perhaps a war of independence, which would do what to Nablus? 
he already knew how wartime could suspend the normal rules. It might free him from his father's command. Syria would be free, and so would Mithat. Jamil met his eye and winked. The mountains beyond the window interrupted the sunlight, sculpting his cousin's cheekbones with their moving shade. Beyond him, the foreign women hunched on the benches. And where would that freedom lead? Teta was right, he did not know what he wanted. His tableau vivant of King Faisal ruling Palestine lapsed into a vision of himself in Cairo, married with small children. He tried to work out where this image had come from and was bewildered to realize that he was imagining himself married to Layla. The echo of a drum fought discordantly with the rhythm of the crankshaft. In English, a woman cried, there are so many people. The window was filled with heads and flags. The roar reached them dimly like a waterfall across a canyon. Midhat put an arm across Jamil to let the women alight first. Several thanked him, and as he bowed and lifted his tarbouche, Jamil hit him on the chest with the back of his hand and laughed. Stepping down was like stepping into a thundercloud. Michael, isn't that the Hebron procession? shouted an Englishman in a boater. I thought they weren't coming for an hour yet. They followed the crowd towards the old city. It thickened and slowed, and a horse appeared by the roadside bearing a stout man with a small block of a moustache. The middle two buttons of his waistcoat had popped open. Ya comrades, his chins distended. Behave peacefully, ya comrades. At Jaffa Gate, they came to a stop behind a group of young European men refusing to go further. Midhat took Jamil by the arm. We're going in? Of course, Midhat shouted, and plunging through the group, released Jamil's arm to clap, borne along under the arch of the gate. The Europeans had moved to one side, and as the parade bent to fit through the entrance, Midhat saw that its tail was made up of Arab women. Many carried banners and placards like the men. A few even waved Sharifian flags. They were shouting something. Palestine Aradna was the first phrase. He could not make out the second. All at once the crush overtook them, and as they were impelled under the vault into the open air on the other side, stay with me, said Midhat, snatching, snatching his cousin's sleeve. They saw more women on the balconies above, throwing coloured handkerchiefs down onto their heads. By a group of drummers, a Sufi dervish in a long gown and jacket of balding velveteen began to dance. His body talked, first one way and then the other, so his garment spun out and the sweet seams twisted. He rocked his head back and forth, patting the ground with his feet. Dust rose in a mist. The crush became an audience, dilating the space around him. A clap started, then one song caught over the discordance of the many and spread around their area, and as someone pushed him closer to the dervish, Midhat lost his hold on Jamil. The dancer's feet patted faster, faster, and Midhat stepped close enough to hear the man's own voice, La ilaha illallah, la ilaha illallah. Then something unexpected happened. Half propped up by people on either side, Midhat experienced a strange, dull explosion in his chest. Something close to joy, but deeper, more serene. He moved his head to the pulse, his tongue ticked against his hard palate. Unable to see the dervish's feet, Midhat watched him revolving with mechanical smoothness, motored by the turbines of his tensed, upstretched wrists. A hand clasped his neck. Is everything all right? Jamil's hair was matted, his forehead shining. A scum filmed his upper lip. Look, look, Dubki. The dervish gave way to a line of village men, grasping elbows and hopping up and down. One at a time, they shuffled to the center of the vacated ring and jumped and kicked. From somewhere, pipes. Midhat looked down at his own legs. His shoes were pale with dust. He felt a shove from behind. You know Dubke. No, I don't. He gasped a laugh and pushed back. The group of women at the rear had moved under the arch, and as the crowd compacted, they settled by the wall and clapped along. One woman near the front, who was not clapping, caught Midhat's attention. She was looking directly at him, staring, in fact, and standing very still. He tried to keep her level in his sight while everyone else jostled, then knew she had detected him because she quickly turned away. She remained in profile, motionless. Without even thinking of Jamil, Midhat pushed towards her. 
Although she did not move her head, he could see the white corner of her eye go black with her turning iris. Without the other eye, the single organ was like an object, and he did not have the feeling of meeting someone's gaze. Instead, he was watching her looking at him. A body blocked his view. He pressed against the next person along to take the woman into his sight again, provoking a knock on his shoulder as the dancing circle closed in on itself. The crowd began to shift. The horde of waiting pilgrims by the gate plunged towards him, and then she turned. He caught her, Fath Muhammad, both eyes, the downward slope at the corners, and though he could not see the rest of her face, the eyes were enough to summon the whole. Um, <clears throat> so uh, their protests are in vain, and the British mandate is ratified by the League of Nations in 1920. Um, and the next section I'm going to read to you, it comes from towards the end, very end of the book, um, from 1936. So until this point, the Palestinian national movement has been led by the elites in Jerusalem mainly and in Nablus, um, and they're not really getting anywhere. Um, Zionist immigration has increased and the British are not giving um, any direct representation. They sort of set up a few advisory councils that are useless, um, which the Arabs continually boycott. And then finally, in 1936, there's a popular uprising led by the Fellahin, by the you know, um, rural communities. So there, there's a sort of um, class struggle that also happens within Palestinian society where it's led by the um, lower classes instead of the elites. And at this point, um, Midhat is in hospital. And this chapter is told from the perspective of his youngest daughter. And her name is Rada. Um, so yeah, here we go. Rada Kamal loved funerals. When school finished at three o'clock, she listened for the sound of drums. And if passing out through the school gates, she heard them, even faint, far off, she would follow. Surveying the road for any hint of unusual commotion, straining over the motor cars for the report of sad voices, there, the pace of traffic slowing, pedestrians diverted down an alley, Rada, scampering along with her empty sandwich case clutched to her chest, one corner turned and then another, coming at last upon the morning procession in their black and dark blues, men first, women second, drums third, the chief mourners by the body taking turns to lead the others in the chant, there is no God but God, and the echo from the rest, there is no God but God. Rada slipped into their ranks and, overwhelmed by the sheer immensity of noise, jubilantly stalked the coffin all the way to the cemetery. One good thing about staying at Sido Nimr and Teta with Dad's house while Baba was away was that it was closer than home both to her school and to the centre of town. The bad thing was there was only one entrance. At home she used to climb the bottom gate and pretend she had been in the flower bed the whole time, but Sido's garden wall was too high, which meant that when she rang the doorbell she gave herself away, and when she did not ring it she also gave herself away. Since her mother consulted the members of the family over whether or not they had heard the bell, and thus found out with ease whether her youngest daughter was in the house. Masadra would equivocate on Rada's behalf. I don't know, perhaps I heard it, perhaps I didn't. But Tahir kept an ear out on purpose. Where is Rada? her mother asked. Is Rada home yet? Ask who died today, Tahir replied. Rada will be with them. The truth of the matter was, their mother did not actually seem to mind that much. What bothered Rada rather was that it seemed increasingly she couldn't do anything without everyone knowing about it. She supposed this must be a hazard of growing older. Her mother had informed them, drifting into their bedrooms at Sido's in a beige nightgown, that they would continue staying at their grandparents' house until their father returned. Rada puffed without speaking, then threw herself onto her bed. She heard Masera ask when he was coming back, and the answer, I don't know. Baba had already missed Rada's seventh birthday. You know you are only one day older, not one year older. It's an illusion, Khalid had said. It was also the day they announced the general strike, which meant her birthday was completely ruined, since of course that was all any of the guests talked about when they came round for cake. The calamity of Rada's life was that when she wanted to be noticed, she was ignored, and when she wanted to be ignored, she was noticed. But other than gunfire at night, since her birthday, the streets had been unusually quiet. When she went out funeral walking, Rada found the shops closed, their metal shutters pulled across and padlocked, the ground cleared of refuse and the husks of merchandise, 
the ribbons and papers and empty boxes that ordinarily littered it at close of market day. And apart from the occasional band of armed fellahin marching through the town, there was no sign of anyone striking anyone else. She wandered, dragging the skein of wool she called her cat up an empty hill towards the eastern cemetery, whether the men of Nablus had gone to Jerusalem to strike people there. She pictured her father at Damascus Gate, hitting someone with his stick. Whatever the cause, the new quiet made it easier than usual to pick out the funereal drums and catch up with the coffins before they reached their graves. One afternoon in June, after the congregants had departed, Rada remained peering in through the archway of the Greek Orthodox Church. A late rain conjured a rich smell out of doors, and her shoes were muddy from the graveyard. But from inside the church, the fumes of incense still emanated, dregs from the tinny censers which minutes before had been swinging up and down the aisles. The priest was the only one left. In long black robes and hat, beard sprawling from the curtains of his habit, he was lighting the tapers, stroking the wicks of the end of his thin candle to impart the flame. The days were getting longer. And yet, owing to a lingering warmth in the wet air, Rada did not anticipate the onset of night. Only when the call to prayer reverberated from the minarets did she notice the light changing behind her. She gasped. Her first instinct was to run, and she would have done so had not the street before the church filled up at that very moment with other people running. She took a breathless step back under the arch. In the half-dark, the runners accumulated. Kufiyas whipping behind their heads, feet hitting the ground. She could hear the clothes rustle against their bodies and the clicks of things they were carrying. She gripped her sandwich case and kept still. The runners thinned, now only two or three passed at a time. There was something weird about the scene, and it was a moment before she understood that it was because no one was speaking. A few salad of gunshots started up in the distance, and a few fellahin ghost men increased their speed. Across the way, a woman appeared in the doorway. She stepped to the side, and three running men passed into her house without dropping pace. What are you doing here, little one? Rada looked up. The priest was pressing the heel of one hand against the armpit of the arch. His eyebrows were big and put his deep eye sockets in shade. Where are your mother and father? Rada's face stretched open. Don't cry, no, no, no. Tutting and pouting the way childless people pouted at children, he crouched to pick her up, and then she was in the air with his arms around her waist, being carried into the church. Tears erupted forcefully from her eyes, her only dam against fear crumbling at this first sign of kindness. Do you know where you live? Of course I know where I live, she broke out, full of scorn. We will wait, he whispered, gesturing at the door, until the rebels are hidden. Two big armoured vehicles appeared in the proscenium of the doorway, mounted with torches that beamed along the road. At last, voices, English shouts. The hard, polished wood of a pew met Rada's backside, and the priest, after closing and bolting the doors, crouched again before her with an agility one did not associate with priests. He was talking again, but she could not hear him. She was too preoccupied with her tears, which were relentless and very tiring. The harsh fibres of a rag rubbed the underside of her nose, and then he was beside her, sitting on the pew. Gunshots screamed beyond the doors. He tried to put his big old hands over her ears, but she pushed them away. By the time silence fell and she had stopped crying, night time was absolute. The priest dragged open the door on the black night and gestured for her to climb into his arms. As they walked, he sang loudly. Irhamna ya rab, irhamna. A slow, plodding melody, very solemn. Rada, hugging his neck, experienced the deep vibrations in her side as the sandwich case, which he was holding in one hand beneath her legs, beat against his thigh. They passed a group of soldiers peeping through the door windows of a house, and the priest increased his volume. The soldiers glanced up like animals and stared. The priest added some English words to the song, which Rada recognized from school. Glory to the Father, the Son, the Spirit, holy. The soldiers lost interest. When he dropped her at the gate, she whispered, Thank you, Father. Good night. The sandwich case dangled from his fingers. For a brief second, he touched the top of her head. She was halfway up the steps when his singing restarted. In the thin light from the windows, the skirt of his black robe swayed from side to side. Her mother opened the door. Where in God's name have you been? The priest brought me home. Priest? 
She slammed the door. The wings of her nose flared. No more funerals. No more. If you don't come home immediately after school, the roulé will follow you and she will eat you. She will eat you. Rada eyed her mother's features, that neck stretched by rage. She looked terribly ugly. Where has Rada been? Thahar was in the hall, dressed in a tweed toot suit and tarbouche too large for him. Go away, said Rada. Don't tell your brother to go away. Thahar cracked a smile and walked off, singing in English. Rada had a little mare, its coat as white as snow, and where that mare and Rada went we're jiggered if we know. Where did you learn that, said Fatme. The boy shrugged. Uzelbart, Uzelbart, where have you been? I've been to Damascus to see Hajj Amin. Stop speaking English. Rada pushed her way past her mother, and when she met no resistance, ran up the stairs to the bedroom. Masarra was sitting in the window, darning a hole in her skirt, which was hitched over her thighs. She glanced up as Rada entered. Rada lay flat on her back, awaiting her punishment. She listened for footsteps, and each time they approached, held her breath. Each time they travelled past the door. She turned to face the wall. The wind crooned and a light rain ticked over the window panes. I'll leave it there. Thank you very, very much. Good evening, my name is Alberto Mangel, and I'm introducing Salman Rushdie. Little more than a century before the publication of the ingenious knight Don Quixote de la Mancha, the today disparaged Christopher Columbus arrived in the new world which he thought was the old, older than Europe, because it belonged to the realm of everything magical and wondrous. He thought it was India. India, in the imagination of Europe, especially in the imagination of the novels of chivalry that made Don Quixote what he became, was the world of marvels. It was populated, as the 14th century traveler Sir John Mandeville confidently tells us, by cyclops, monopods. Monopods are people with just one foot, so they put their foot up to protect themselves from the sun, because it's sunny in India. Cannibals, men with their head beneath their shoulders, and also the phoenix, and hordes of weeping crocodiles, and other creatures endemic to this utterly foreign place. Columbus and his followers were prepared then for what they saw in the world they thought they were discovering. There were the tribes of fierce Amazons fighting in the forest that Bolsonaro is now destroying, the dragon-like weeping crocodiles, which we call alligators, in the swamps of Florida where the American president has now appropriately taken residence. The geography of the imagination is much more powerful than the geography of political atlases. Therefore, it should surprise no reader that Salman Rushdie, chronicler of so many adventures in the magical East, has now crossed the ocean and reclaimed Columbus's India for his personal kingdom. The new world the United States depicted in Quixote is as wonderful as the island of Barataria in Don Quixote's world and as commonplace as the landscape of La Mancha. When in the novel Rushdie contraposes life in the States with life in India, that of the States becomes even more uncanny, more unbelievable. The story of Quixote, we are told at the beginning of the novel, has been with the author all his life. 
but he's hesitated to put it on paper because to do so, he says, would be to reveal himself to his subject. That, however, is a risk that Rushdie has already taken. From his very first book, from the very first pages of Grimus, all the way through Midnight's Children, the Satanic Verses, Shalimar the Clown, Joseph Anton and the others, readers have never doubted the identity of that bearded, wise Sherizad who's telling us the story. What did surprise me was how long it took Rashti to recognize his blood ties to Don Quixote. Cervantes could call Rashti or Rashti Cervantes a spiritual twin. He is that. The enchantment produced by one's reading, the conjuring act that changes creatures of ink and paper into beings of flesh and blood, the ever hovering question, and what happened next? All these causes and effects of the craft of fiction pepper rush these books and are the matter, the matter of which they are made. In these tangled webs of honest deceit that Rushdie spins for us, we, the readers, are caught forever. Like the wonders Columbus carried in his reader's imagination to these shores, Rushdie's wonders are with us all the time. For me, for instance, Saladin and Gabriel from the satanic verses and the immigration police at the beginning of that novel are now struggling on the other side of the infamous wall and in the concentration camp for children in Texas. And from now on, I won't be able to look at those defining products of American popular culture from reality shows to game shows from conspiracy theories to everyday racism, except through the eyes of Mr. Rushdie's Mr. Smile, otherwise known as Quixote. Ours, as Quixote reminds us, and Twitter proves, is the age of anything can happen, with another vocabulary, of course. Our Dulcinea, is a heroin addicted pop star and our windmills are not imagined ogres, they are ogres. The contract between reader and writer is one that Rushdie, like Cervantes, recognizes and upholds, akin to the knight's code of honor in the novels of chivalry. In Quixote, Rushdie puts it like this, Men on the road have three choices. They separate, they kill one another, or they work things out. Salman, I promise you will try to work things out. Please greet Salman Rusty. Thank you. Um, just to say how nice it is to follow a, as wonderful a reading as Isabella Hamad's. Uh, I'm going to give you a somewhat different kind of book. And in this particular bit that I'm going to read, the character, the, the traveling salesman who gives himself the pseudonym Quichotte in order to write anonymous letters to the woman he's fallen in love with who is a TV star who he doesn't know who is famous and powerful and rich and beautiful and young and all these things that he is not. This doesn't stop him at all. Love will find a way, he thinks. He's also, he's a lonely man. He's somebody who spent much of his life traveling uh, as a pharmaceutical rep in a Chevy Cruze in a staying in a series of cheap motels and watching 
appalling quantities of crappy television, which have, which have sort of driven him mad. And, and one of the madnesses is that it's, he, he's always wanted a child, so he invents a child. He calls into being a teenage son by an act of magic, literally by wishing upon a star. The son manifests himself in the passenger seat of the Chevy Cruze in black and white. And uh, at this moment, Kishat and his son, who he calls, obviously calls Sancho, um, um, are, um, they're beginning a journey across America on this quest for impossible love, for the hand of Miss Salma R. Miss Salma R, whose name is one consonant shorter than mine by some extraordinary coincidence. Anyway, so they're, they're on their way. This is chapter nine, an unpleasantness at Lake Capote and subsequent disturbances in reality. Labor Day. The journey to the Valley of Love had to wait because first there was trouble to overcome at the camp. It was in Kishot's nature to assume that everyone who approached him came in friendship and he greeted all strangers with his delightful and usually disarming smile. So when the wide-bodied young white lady in denim dungarees, her fair hair gathered behind her head in a loose bun, came bustling toward the trestle table at Lake Capote where he and Sancho were poring over the map of America, Kishot stood up courteously and even bowed slightly. In his formal way, he was about to launch into a little speech of greeting when the lady went on the attack. What is that? The white lady said, jerking a thumb in the direction of the map. You hatching some kind of scheme? We are travelers like yourself, Kishot replied mildly. So it is not unreasonable that we should map out our route. Where are your turbans and beards? The white lady asked. Her, her arm extended toward him, an angry finger pointing right at him. You people, you wear beards and turbans, right? You shave your face and take the headgear off to fool us? Turbans, she repeated slowly, making a swirling turban gesture around her head. I think I can say without fear of inaccuracy that I have never worn a turban in my life, Kishot replied, with a degree of puzzlement that displeased his interrogator. You got a bad foreign look to you, the white lady said. Sound foreign too. I suspect few of the campers at Lake Capote are from around here, Kishot said, still smiling his increasingly inappropriate smile. It's a destination for visitors, is it not? You yourself must have driven some distance to get here. That's something. You asking me where I'm from? I'm gonna tell you where I'm from. I'm from America. Who knows how you got here? This ain't a place for you. You shouldn't be allowed past the border controls. How do you get in? You look like you come from a country on that no entry list. You hitch a ride with a Mexican? What are you looking for in America? What's your purpose? That map, I'm not loving the map. At this point, Sancho, in his youthful, hot-headed way, intervened. Ma'am, he said, that part at least was polite. Why don't you do yourself a favor and don't be in our business? That was fuel on the flame. She rounded on Sancho and stabbed her finger in his direction. I must tell you the word on you, she said. Seems you keep showing up and vanishing, but that car there, it don't move. Where do you come from? Where do you go? Are there more of you hold up somewhere close, appearing, disappearing, hiding out? Who the hell knows? You look shifty to me. You up to something. You can dress yourself out of J. Crew, but you don't fool me. 
A small crowd had gathered, and it was getting bigger as the woman's voice got louder. Two camp security guards came up. Uniforms, holstered guns, a judge and jury way with them. You two are disturbing the peace, one said. He wasn't looking at the white lady. You need to pack up and get gone, the second guard said. What's your religion, the white lady asked. It is my good fortune, Kishot replied, no longer so courteously, that having passed through the first valley, my son and I are both blessedly free from doctrines of all sorts. Say what, said the white lady. I have cast aside all dogma, both of belief and unbelief, Kishot said. I am embarked on a high spiritual quest for purification to be worthy of my beloved. A man's voice from the crowd. He's saying he's godless scum. He's planning something for sure, the white lady said. He's got a map. He could be ISIS. He can't be ISIS and godless scum at the same time. <laughs> the first security guard pointed out, displaying an admirable capacity for logical thinking <laughs> and, and trying to maintain order. Let's not, carry, let's not get carried away, ladies and gents. In, in ancient times, Kishot said in a last appeal to reason, when a woman was accused of witchcraft, the proofs were that she had a familiar, usually a cat, plus a broomstick and a third nipple for the devil to suck on. But almost all homes had cats and brooms, and in those days, many people's bodies had warts. Thus, the mere accusation, which, was all that was required. The proof was in every home and on every woman's body, and therefore all women so accused were automatically guilty. You need to quit talking trash and leave, the second security guard said. These folks here are pretty uncomfortable about your presence here, and you talking that way is no help. We can't guarantee your safety much longer, and I'm not so sure we're even inclined to do so. Sancho looked as if he wanted to fight. But in the end, he and Kishat packed their possessions into the cruise. The crowd grumbled but slowly dispersed. The white lady, encouraged to back off by the security guards, stood a little way off, shaking her head. In the old days, the white lady yelled as they drove away, there'd have been some frontier justice done today. She was wearing some strange type of choker around her neck. It looked almost like a collar you'd put on a dog. Sancho, now a somewhat less imaginary being than before, considers his new situation. After the business with the white lady, everything changed. And FYI, if I accidentally said a little prayer a while ago, it's not because I suddenly got religion, it's because it's pretty scary being driven by him. Daddy. He drives the way he does everything, the way he sees it done on TV. He drove out of that camp at Lake Capote like he was Al or Bobby Unser at Indianapolis, and he hasn't slowed down since. I sit in the back seat because it feels safer there. But he twists his head around and talks to me while he's doing maybe 55 or 60 down a two-lane blacktop because that happens all the time on the shows. Only when that happens on the shows, the car is attached to a truck off screen that's doing the real driving. Half a dozen times a day, I think, I'm about to find out if there's an afterlife five minutes after I got myself a life. If I'm real, I can really die, right? I'm leaning now against the side of the cruise in a gas station drinking a Coke, wiping the cold sweat of passenger terror off of my forehead and thinking about this, this real thing, i.e. the question of being real. And I'm getting the uncomfortable feeling that the question's about to be answered thanks to an imminent fatal smash up on the road. I have to add that if after I turn into roadkill and float up through the twisted metal, I find a god up there on the judgment seat. If that turns out to be what's real, clouds, pearly gates, flights of angels, all that jazz, it's gonna be a shock. But 
I'm not, I'm not wanting to get into a discussion about paradise today. For now, I just want to feel safe in the back seat of the car. That's the only seat on my mind. Slow down, I tell him. Watch the road. I even yell at him, but he just waves a hand in the air. I've been driving for a living, he tells me. I've been doing this since before you were born. Yeah, I tell him, but that wasn't so long ago, was it? <laughs> Please do not forget, I was literally born yesterday. Well, literally a little before yesterday, but you get my point. I'm a lot younger than I look because I'm growing up fast. Also, my head is full of him, his version of everything. So it's hard for me to stand outside and see him for what he is. Even now, after I Pinocchioed myself into flesh and blood, I can't see myself as a being that's totally apart from him. I'm still more a part of than apart from, you see. I hate to say it because it's easy to observe he's not the best of captains, but he's still the one steering the ship. I'm thinking now about the hunt for the great white whale. Obviously, the only way I know about this is that he, A, read the book in a motel room somewhere when the TV was on the fritz, or, yes, this is the right answer, B, he watched Gregory Peck, Richard Basehart, and Leo Gedd in the old movie on AMC back in the wall-to-wall -wall rerun days before Mad Men, Breaking Bad, and The Walking Dead. Anyway, here's my thought. The mad captain who's obsessed by the whale dies with the whale, along with his crew who are almost as whale crazy as he is. Ishmael, the one crew member who is not obsessed, the one character who's just along for the ride, it's just a job to him, he's the one who lives to tell the tale. From which we learn the lesson that detachment is the key to survival. Obsession destroys the possessed. Something like that. So if the old cruise is our Pequod, then I guess Miss Salma R is the big fish, and he, Daddy, is my Ahab which leads me to inquire, did she do something to him sometime? Did she bite off his metaphorical leg? Which is a sex metaphor, right? Leg being obviously a, what's the word? Euphemism. A stand-in word for some other limb. And wooden leg being a term containing the word wood. Ha, ha, ha. Laughing, <laughs> laughing face with tears coming out of the eyes emoji. <laughs> or is it just her being in the world and ignoring him that makes him feel, what's the word, wooden-legged? If the beloved is oblivious to the lover, might the lover want to hunt her down and harpoon her? Might he want to end up tied to her by harpoon ropes and drown with her ecstatically in the black depths of the sea? From hell's heart I stab at thee? Interesting, no? That that's the line from the book that is stuck in his head, and therefore I have it in mine. Which leads to the million dollar question, what does he want to do with her? When he ever gets close enough to do anything, which is pretty fucking improbable, Kiss or kill? There are bits of his head I don't have access to. The answer to my question may lie in those hidden bits. Follow-up question, why are there bits of his head that deny me access? How does this being a part of him thing actually work? Okay, I I'm guessing here, but here's the way I'm looking at it. I see myself as a visitor in his inner world. And I see that world as an actual place with like cities and countryside and lakes and such, with transportation systems. And across a lot of that world, I have no obstacles. I can roam about freely and I have access to everything he has access to, to episodes in his past and shows he's watched and books he's read and people he has known and the whole, what's the word, population of his memories and knowledge and thoughts and maybe even dreams. But as I see more and more clearly, he isn't well in the head. 
And I reckon the parts I can't see are the crazy parts, the parts that are so messed up that the gateways to them are blocked, so ruined that the homes in there have fallen down, like what you see on TV about bombed out war zones in like Syria. Those parts are like scrambled jigsaw puzzles or fog bound or just destroyed. There aren't any planes landing there. The roads are fucked and maybe they're landmined also. The whole area is sealed off, for example, let's say by UN peacekeeping forces. The, the blue helmet dudes, what do they call them? Smurfs. Uh, which means there's no entry, not unless the Smurfs let you in. I think we're both disturbed by what happened at Lake Capote. Daddy Q looks like his thoughts are whirling around him like windmills. Right now, he, he just seems lost. After the bird shit at the lake, I thought, at least now we are going somewhere. New York or bust start spreading the news. We're heading there like everyone does, to be loved or broken, to be born again or to die. What else is there to do that's worth doing? Nothing. There's a woman waiting there for him. She doesn't know she's waiting, but she is. Or she does know, but she isn't waiting. She doesn't care, and when he learns that lesson, then that will be the end of him. And meanwhile, if I may, what's the word, interject? What about me? Maybe this adventure could have someone in it for me. That's what I'm interested in. I have an imaginary girlfriend in my head, and I need to turn her into a real one. She's walking the New York streets, and she's lonely just like me. And wait, what do I see? Is she walking back to me? <laughs> That's my pretty woman dream balloon right there. But his behavior is bursting it. After the confrontation at Lake Capote, it's like the balance of his mind got disturbed. If he was at least partly clear-minded before, he's all unclear now. New York seems to have become a vague concept. Sure, sure, he mutters when I ask him, we'll get there, we'll get there. It's like the valleys, he says, it's a state of mind. Most days now, all he wants is a motel and a TV. That's the world that's real to him. And this world, the one with unfriendly white ladies in it, is what he wants to shut out. And sometimes I think that's all there's gonna be, this endless drifting and watching and no arriving, an odyssey without an Ithaca, without a Penelope, and myself, a displaced Telemachus doomed to wander with him, far from any idea of destination or home, far, I have to repeat this, from girls. I'm new here. I'm trying to understand how the world works, his world, the only one available to me, the world according to Kishat. I'm trying to get a sense of the normal, but it keeps dissolving around me. On TV, because having no option, I'm watching a lot of TV myself right now, everybody seems to know what's normal, and at the same time, nobody agrees. I'm using the remote to find out. I is this what's normal, I ask him? A couch in a living room with a staircase behind it and an armchair to the side and a father in the armchair and a mom in the kitchen and teenage children rushing in and out wanting sandwiches and quarreling, but every 30 minutes minus commercials, there's a group hug? Yes, he says, life is like this for normal people. Or, I say, is normal a couch in a living room with a staircase behind it and an armchair to the side and a loud woman's big comeback killed by a tweet referencing the Muslim Brotherhood and Planet of the Apes? That's a less normal normal, he says. Zap, sports channel. Normal is nine innings, four balls, three strikes, somebody wins, somebody loses, there's no such thing as a tie. Zap, normal is unreal people, mostly rich unreal people, having sex with rappers and basketball players and thinking of their unreal family as a real world brand like Pepsi or Drano or Ford. Zap, news channels, normal is guns and the normal America that really wants to be great again, 
Then there's another normal if your skin color is the wrong color, and another if you're educated, and another if you think education is brainwashing, and there's an America that believes in vaccines for kids, and another that says that's a con trick, and everything one normal believes is a lie to another normal, and they're all on TV depending where you look. So yeah, it's confusing. I'm really trying to understand which this is America now. Zap, 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 a man with his head in a bag being shot by a man without a shirt on. Fat man in a red hat screaming at men and women, also fat, also in red hats, about victory. Zap, normal, is upside down land. Our old friends are our enemies now, and our old enemy is our pal. Zap, zap, men and men, women and women in love. The Purple Mountain's Majesty, a man with an oil painting of himself with Jesus hanging in his living room. Dead school kids, hurricanes, beauty, lies, zap, zap, zap. Normal doesn't feel so normal to me, I tell him. It's normal to feel that way, he replies. This is what I get instead of fatherly wisdom. Meanwhile, things fall apart as well as people. Countries fall apart, as well as their citizens. A zillion channels and nothing to hold them together. Garbage out there, great stuff out there too, and they both coexist at the same level of reality. Both give off the same air of authenticity. How is a young person supposed to tell them apart? How to discriminate? Every show on every network tells you the same thing, based upon a true story. But that's not true either. The true story is, there's no true story anymore. There's no true anymore that anyone can agree on. There's a headache beginning here. Boom, here it is. Ow, what a time for me to arrive. Something is going wrong, even I can tell that. Something's badly off, not only with him, but also with the world outside the motel room. Some error in space and time. The motel room itself is unchanging wherever we are, whatever the name on the illuminated sign above the forecourt. Inside the room, things are pretty constant. Twin beds, TV, pizza delivery, floral print curtains. In the bathroom, plastic cups wrapped in plastic bags. Small refrigerator, empty. Nightstand lamps, one bulb working by his bedside, one not by mine. Paper thin walls, so there's other entertainment if we don't want to watch TV. But we do, we always do. There's a lot of shouting. People drink in motel rooms from bottles in brown paper bags. And then they shout, they yell their lonely sadness into the empty night. But they also yell at each other if they aren't traveling alone or down the phone or at the motel staff. These are few in number, shoulder shrugging in attitude, just sometimes silence inducing, large and menacing, but more frequently, Tony Perkinsy, black, white, Hispanic, South Asian Bates Motel Tony Perkinses, with small, mysterious, psycho smiles. I'd be scared of them, I am scared of them. I keep my voice down. There's less sex than you'd think. There is some, mostly perfunctory, mostly paid for, the price probably not high. I say probably because at this point, sex remains beyond my personal experience. If I had a credit card, I might try to rectify that. He has not as yet provided me with usable plastic. Therefore, I remain tragically, angrily a virgin. What there mostly is, is snoring. The music of the American nose is a thing to be awestruck by. The machine gun, the woodpecker, the MGM lion, the drum solo, the dog bark, the dog yap, the whistle, the idling car engine, the racing car turbo booster, the hiccup, the SOS snorts, three short, three long, three short, the long growl of the ocean wave, the more menacing rumble of rolling thunder, the short splash of the sleeping sneeze, the two-tone tennis player's grunt, the simple breathe in, breathe out common or garden snore, the constantly surprising erratic snore with unpredictable randomized intervals. The motorcycle, the lawnmower, the hammer drill, the sizzling frying pan, the log fire, the shooting range, the war zone, 
the morning cockerel, the nightingale, the fireworks display, the tunnel at rush hour, the traffic jam, the Albenberg, the Schoenberg, the Philip Glass, the feedback loop, the static of the untuned radio, the rattlesnake, the death rattle, the castanets, the washboard, the hum. These and others are my nightly friends. Fortunately, I am blessed with the gift of sleep. I close my eyes and I'm off. I never remember my dreams. I think that I do not as yet possess the capacity for dreams. I suspect I have no imagination. I reckon I'm a pretty WYSIWYG type, which makes it even more unnerving that the world outside the motel room has totally ceased to be straightforward. I'm just gonna say this straight out, even though it makes me sound like Daddy Q is not the only one with a screw loose. Here it is. When I wake up in the morning and open the door of the motel room, I can't be sure of which town I'll find outside, or what day of the week, or what month of the year. I can't even be sure of which state we'll be in, although I'm in a great state about it, thank you very much. It's as if we are standing still and the world is traveling past us. Or maybe the world is TV and I don't know who's in charge of the zapper. So maybe there is a God? Is that the third person in here? The God who's fucking with me and with everybody else for that matter, arbitrarily changing the rules? I thought there were rules about changing the rules. I thought even if I buy the idea that somebody slash something created all this, isn't that something slash somebody bound by the laws of creation once, it's, once he's done creating? Or can he, can he just shrug shoulders and say no more gravity and goodbye we all float off into space? And if this entity, let's call it God because why not, it's traditional, can in fact change the rules just because it feels in the mood, let's understand what exactly is the rule that's being changed here. There's a rule that goes, places must remain in the same physical relationship to other places. And if you want to get from one place to the other, you've got to travel the same distance, full stop always and forever. You'd think that was a pretty goddamn immutable rule. Otherwise, what happens to all the roads and trains and planes? How would it be, for example, if you decided to live as far away from your mother-in-law as possible, and then boom, you wake up and open your door and she's standing on your doorstep with a cake because her house just moved in across the road. How do we even begin to understand what a town is or a city if motels can slide across space and time from one to the other? What happens to population counts and electoral rolls? The whole system collapses, doesn't it? Is that what you're after? You're like the deranged worker with a sledgehammer in the old plumber joke, smashing up company toilets and railway station washrooms and writing up that slogan, how does it go again? If the cistern cannot be changed, it must be destroyed? Jesus Christ, it's the end of the fucking world happening right outside my motel door. Today, for example, this morning. Last night, I go to sleep in the Drury Inn in Amarillo, Texas, population 199,582, if that even means anything anymore. And I dream about yesterday at the Cadillac Ranch art installation out on Route 66, all those 50s Eldorado fins diving into or maybe backing up out of the Texas earth. Cadillac, Cadillac, long and dark, dust shiny and black, thank you, Bruce, he's singing to me in my dream. Buddy, when I die, throw my body in the back, drive me to the junkyard in my Cadillac. Amarillo's some kind of a wild dream itself, man. They harvest helium in the fields here, and they assemble those nuclear weapons over at Pantex. They pack a lot of meat, and they eat a lot of beef. They've got Amy Lou Harris's lost boyfriend playing the pinball machines and they all meet down at the Cadillac Ranch. Great dream, I have to say. Fast cars, big sky, hot girls in cutoffs, dancing in 10 gallon hats, I'm loving it. Then I wake up and I take a look outside and I almost faint. I'm on a balcony up on maybe the 10th floor instead of the first floor with the car parked right outside the door of the room. My head spins, where am I? Where is this exactly? 
And even more scarily, when is this? Because over there, poking its head up above the transformed streets that don't look like Amarillo at all, is the old World Trade Center itself. Yeah, the one the planes hit. The Twin Towers, except there's only one of them. It's impossible, but it's there. So maybe we somehow time and space traveled and we've made it to New York, but not New York now, New York then. We're somehow back on that horrible day and the South Tower fell already, which is why I can't see it. But this doesn't look like New York City. Not at any point in this history, this is a different place. The tower standing over there isn't big enough. Did everything get miniaturized when I wasn't looking? Honey, I shrunk the world. I call out to him and make him get out of bed and take a look. Where the hell are we? I ask him. And how did we get here? I'm freaked out, but he hears it in my voice. Tulsa, Oklahoma, he says. And he's using his kind, soothing dad voice. Is there a problem? I can't believe what he's saying. Yes, there's a problem, I say. What happened to Amarillo? Isn't this the Amarillo Drury Inn? Isn't that where we checked in last night? And by the way, how come there's a twin tower over there? There are no Drury locations in Oklahoma, says he. This is the Tulsa Doubletree. And I lunge past him to grab the notepad by the phone. Doubletree by Hilton Tulsa, it reads. I'm losing my mind. Can stuff like this happen now? He's behaving as if nothing happened. Yeah, we drove here, he says. You were sleeping, you don't remember? The elevator, you were pleased to be up high for once. You crashed. It's bizarre that you don't remember at all. I look at him hard. I'm trying to see if he's gaslighting me. It's not the first time, I say. What isn't, he asks. This location dislocation, I say. He just shakes his head. Have some coffee, he suggests. It will clear your thoughts. What's the date, I ask him. And he tells me, this is worse. This is not the day after yesterday. How did we get to September 11 already? It's fucked up. And of course, a part of me is thinking, maybe I'm not as fully human as I think. Maybe there are blackouts, moments of non-existence, bugs in the program. Maybe I just freeze like a FaceTime image when the Wi-Fi is weak, and then eventually unfreeze. Is that what he wants me to think? Because that way I have to defer to him at all times. Is that what he wants? A deferential, non-independent-minded kid? Am I getting paranoid? You bet I am. And then I think of something even worse. My brain is working overtime and coming up with nothing but bad news. Maybe according to my brain, this is the way things are these days in America. That for some of us, the world has stopped making sense. Anything can happen. Here can be there, then can be now, up can be down, truth can be lies. Everything's slip sliding around and there's nothing to hold on to. The whole thing has come apart at the seams. For some of us who have started seeing the stuff, the rest of us are too blind to see or too determined not to see it. For them it's shrug, business as usual, the earth's still flat and the climate isn't changing. Down there on the street, cars full of the shruggers are driving around. Shrugger pedestrians are walking to work. The ghost of Woody Guthrie is walking its ribbon of highway, singing this land was made for you and me. Even Woody hasn't heard the end of the world news. Anyway, I say, you haven't explained that. I'm pointing at the tower, which is the ghost of the other tower. What is that doing in fucking Oklahoma? And of course, he has an explanation for that too. It's well known. It has a name and a street address. It was built by the same architect, Yamasaki, and it's supposed to be a smaller scale replica. Move along, kid. Nothing to see here. Calm down. Let's get some eggs. I'm beginning to understand why people get religion. Just to have something solid that doesn't change into a slippery snake without a word of warning. Something eternal. How comforting when you can't trust yourself to wake up in the same town you went to sleep in. Metamorphosis is frightening. Revolutions end up killing more people than the regimes they overthrew. A change is not as good as a rest. I don't know how many people there are out there who have started seeing what I'm seeing, experiencing what I'm experiencing. 
but I bet I'm not the only one. In which case, there are a lot of frightened people out there, a lot of terrified visionaries. Even the prophets, when visions started talking to them, at first thought they were going mad. He's frightened too, Daddy Q. After Lake Kapodi, something happened to that innocent trust in people he always had. Maybe things haven't fully come apart from him, for him, not yet. But I know he's shaken. Let's see how he goes forward. If he does, I'm watching him. Also, I'm going to start looking out for those other people, the ones like me, with the end time in their eyes. Thank you. Thank you both. Just a few questions before the, the signing. For Salman, this first one. As your introducer implied, Don Quixote has been an influence on your work for a long time. What made you decide to address it head on at this stage in your career? Or was it rather something to do with the times we find ourselves living through? You know, it was kind of just a happy accident. Um, I'd been thinking of writing a, a journey novel anyway. And, uh, you know, because my previous two books had all happened in New York, and I thought, time to leave town, you know, time to exit from the 212 area code. And so I'd been thinking about that anyway, and then I got, by a coincidence, I got asked to write something about Cervantes. Um, because four years ago, it was the 400th anniversary of both Cervantes and Shakespeare. Anyway, somebody asked me to write a piece so I read it, I read Don Quixote again after a very, very long time. And I suddenly thought, oh, these might be wonderful companions on the journey that I want to take. And then I started thinking about my own versions of them, you know, and, and I mean, actually, you know, Quixote, who I just read a little bit about, is he's not really like Don Quixote because the most, the most well-known characteristic of Don Quixote is that he's melancholy, you know, he's, the knight of the dolorous countenance. You know? And my character is relentlessly cheerful and optimistic, even when there's no reason for it. And my Sancho, of course, is not at all Sancho Panza. You know, he's a teenage boy. Um, and a bit more like Pinocchio than Sancho Panza. It's kind of Pinocchio meets Don Quixote. <laughs> anyway, that's, it started like that. It started kind of backwards. Um, and um, yeah. For Bella, this one. You've said that the Parisian is based on the life of your great-grandfather. When did you first hear his story, and what was it that made you decide that that was the book you wanted to write? Um, I, I heard stories about him growing up. He was also called Midhat, as unimaginatively. <laughs> I, I kind of got stuck with the name. I thought I couldn't name him something else after that. Um, and when I was a teenager, I decided I wanted to write a novel based on his life. Um, he was known as the Parisian in Nablus because he had all these French affectations having studied in, in France. Um, yeah, so actually when I was a teenager, I started to interview my grandmother about him. And I have these old tapes of her talking about the general strike of 1936. But then it wasn't until later that I decided to, um, after I left university, I decided to actually have a go at, at writing the novel. And it's, I mean, it's very fictionalized, you know. I, and that's partly because I didn't know him. And... I only have the sort of like bare, the skeleton of his life and some anecdotes, the famous anecdotes um, about the romance with the, with the French woman and a few other things. So it, in a way, the, the, the project of writing this novel was, was me filling in the blanks um, and trying to think about who this man might have been to have made certain decisions and to have um, lived in a certain way. Um, so it's heavily fictionalized, but yeah. Maybe we'll just do one more. Um, and it's for both of you. Uh, Bella, if you, if you want to go first. Um, how does living in New York City inform your work? And um, how does living in any city uh, transfer into one's writing? Um, New York is sort of an amazing place because you have so much... Uh, it's, it's such an alive city. Um, it feels in many ways like a crossroads. It's somewhere where people come through on their way to somewhere else or they stay a few years. And so it feels very, very alive and rich with the arts. At the same time, it is a place where it is 
easy to go. I mean, you know, you can go into libraries or um, and a place where it is easy to retreat into yourself and get work done. And I did write the majority of my novel while I was here. Um, so I feel very much, I associate my novel, even though it has no, <laughs> it bears no trace of um, a New York influence, I don't think. I, in my life, it very much is bound up with my life in New York. You know, I'd, I've been, I've been kind of in love with New York since I was her age. <laughs> or, or even younger, actually, if that was possible. Um, I, I think I came to New York for the first time in 1970. I was like 26, something like that. And um, I mean, in the in the early 70s, and the, it was that different city, you know, which was broke and dirty and dangerous and very young and very creative, you know. And I remember being down in 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 Soho, and they were surrounded by young artists and writers and filmmakers and actors and paint, you know, all sorts of creative people. And I thought, how much fun is this, you know? And I just then thought to myself, one of these days I'm gonna just come and I'm just gonna put myself here and I'm gonna see what happens. And then, you know, then life happens to you and you don't do it for a long time. And by the time I got here, which is about 20 years ago, of course, it's a different New York now, but, but it's still New York City. and. And I came here really not knowing what to expect. I didn't know whether I was going to come for six months or the rest of my life, you know, and it turns out to be the rest of my life. So I think it's been very important for me, you know. Um, I mean, I'm a big city boy. I grew up in Bombay. I lived for a long time in London and now for 20 years here. I like big cities, you know. I feel at home in them. And this one perhaps more than any other. Well, New York welcomes you both, thanks you, and um, get your book signed. Thanks for coming.